All right, I'd like to go ahead and call the uh, stationary source meeting uh, to order. And uh, can we go ahead and do a roll call? It looks like we got Joe Lou in the boardroom there, and uh, yeah. Manny, is that you out in the desert? Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. Perez, good to see you guys. All right, we have a quorum. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll move into our first item is the uh, update on the proposed amended rule 1469, uh, excellent Chrome. And uh, Susan. Okay, so uh, we are back here again and um, want to provide a little overview of the extensiveness of our rulemaking process. We really um, started looking at this issue back in 2014. Uh, there was ambient monitoring in Newport Beach uh, that uh, uh, was the first of the uh, other ambient monitoring efforts where we started to see these unregulated tanks in the high levels of hexavalent chrome. Uh, we started a series of site visits, uh, working group meetings, 13 of those. Uh, we had three public workshops and, and two public meetings. Uh, we have briefed the Stationary Source Committee an unprecedented six times. Uh, and uh, we have uh, set the hearing three times. And uh, at the last public hearing in September, uh, the direction was that we would return back in December. So we're here today to provide you an update and a briefing. And staff is recommending that we um, come back in November instead of December. And we want to give you an update of where we are in the rulemaking process. Uh, background information in regards to hexavalent chrome. I think we uh, are all aware in regards to uh, that this is a known human carcinogen. Uh, the potency of hexavalent chrome when you look at it compared to other carcinogens is uh, orders of magnitude higher. Um, it is, um, even at small quantities, can present a... a a relatively high health risk. Uh, we have unregulated tanks that are high emitting uh, that are significantly impacting surrounding communities. This is, a, um, this is what the unregulated tank looks like. Uh, the objective of 1469 is to address the issues that we found in the monitoring and to require air pollution controls. Um, can you click on the... Oops, sorry. Here, I'll go back on the slides. Yeah, yeah. Just click on the slide. There you go. So this is um, one of this is a heated sodium dichromate tank. Uh, this is currently with no pollution controls. This is uh, the heat is a, a vehicle for steam that carries the emissions. When you have a vent that's uh, like this, then it's just carrying the emissions straight out to the atmosphere uncontrolled. There's about 30 chromic uh, acid anodizing facilities that have unregulated tier three tanks that need these pollution controls. We're trying to get to the finish line on this rule. Uh, we did the ambient monitoring. We did some uh, screening tests and emissions tests on these tanks. Uh, we've identified the unregulated tanks. Their emission levels are about 300% above the proposed emission standard of 0.2 milligrams per hour that we're proposing in the rule. Um, based on site visits and ambient monitors, we have visited facilities that have uh, doors that will be open on, on uh, opposite ends that create a cross draft and somewhat of a wind tunnel and allow these emissions to flow out of the building. So proposed amendment rule 1469 is to uh, address these issues and we're uh, trying to push forward to uh, get this rule adopted. Structure of the rule is we have, uh, we've labeled these tanks as tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one tanks are low emission potential tanks. There's no controls that are required. Tier two tanks are uh, tanks that might be on sort of the cusp of a tier three tank. Uh, we don't think that it warrants a need for uh, the uh, add-on air pollution controls. They can control these emissions with tank covers, uh, other types of mechanical controls. Tier three tanks are the tanks the, such as a heated sodium dichromate tank uh, definitely has a high emission potential. Air add-on air pollution controls are needed. Um, staff, when we did the analysis for the socioeconomic analysis, assumed that uh, many of the tier two tanks would be tier three. Uh, we estimate that about half of the tanks can be controlled with lowering their temperature, uh, using a chemical instead of an um, a electrolytic type of a stripping technique, and that there's ways for them to not need to put on the pollution controls and they can comply with the rule with the tier two. So one of the requests at the September hearing was for us to um, go a little deeper into the cost impacts. 85% um, of the cost impacts are, are born from the uh, installation of air pollution controls and the source testing associated with it. Uh, so when we look at the additional pollution controls, it's primarily for the chromic acid anodizing facilities that have these types of tanks. 
uh, the costs associated with this when you look at the capital, the O&M, uh, and the source testing provision that the annualized cost is over $82,000 um, for a facility. And the average annual revenue when we look at the chromic acid anodizing facilities is about $14 million. So I wanted to provide a little more context and background uh, in regards to the comments that we received through the process and start back um, at the April Stationary Source Committee meeting. Uh, we had 13 facilities that had testified and had uh, provided comments and the overall concern uh, in April was uh, jobs and the uh, compliance costs associated with implementing Proposed Amendment Rule 1469. So staff reached out to each of these facilities and offered to either uh, come out to their facility, meet with the facility, uh, or offer if the facility just wanted to have a phone call. So 11 of the 13 facilities we met with, uh, we discussed the provisions of the rule, and we made a number of revisions. Um, so uh, from that, uh, the key issues that they, they raised uh, were in regards to source testing, building enclosures, compressed air, and then some other clarifications in the rule. So we walked through their facility, we went through the provisions, how it worked, uh, we discussed what their concerns were, uh, sat down with them to um, really show them how they can, uh, options that they had to comply with the proposed amendment rule. So based on the site visits and the phone calls and the meetings with, with these facilities, uh, we made a number of revisions to 1469. So the July version of 1469 had a series of uh, revisions that to address the concerns of the uh, facilities. Then... We thought we were in a good place. We had the public hearing in, on September 7th. Uh, and then we received um, a fair number of comments in regards to the cost of the rule. Uh, three facilities uh, had commented that the proposed amended rule would impact the future of their business and, and uh, expressed concerns about job impact and had employees also comment about the concern for, for their jobs. Um, the rural staff had visited all three of these facilities in April and actually had multiple site visits with them prior to that. And the July uh, revision did incorporate the, 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 their concerns in April. Um, and so we thought we had addressed every concern and issue uh, that they had. So uh, as we look uh, at these three facilities, uh, the total number of folks that had commented at the public hearing in September was over 20 people for these three facilities. So the three facilities were General Bright Plating, X Aircraft, uh, Aircraft X-Ray, and Metal Services, Inc. So uh, this is not in any order of, of those facilities, but wanted to give uh, a little more context in regards to the cost to revenue for these three facilities. Um, so in the socioeconomic analysis, we did do a small business impact analysis, looking at the cost of revenue, looking at the revenue that's based on uh, information that we obtained from Dun and Bradstreet, and then the cost associated with implementing proposed amendment rule 1469. Uh, so for uh, all three facilities, their cost of revenue is less than 1% uh, and goes as low as 0.01% for, for one of the facilities. We did receive, and I think the board members also received um, information from another facility I think it was this week or last week in regards to uh, some cost impacts. And uh, they had a cost estimate that they said, you know, could be applied to all other facilities. So we, we used the information for this facility. Uh, and if we were to use their cost, the cost to revenue would be less than 1%. Um, also wanted to just highlight the community concerns. Um, there's a, a number of issues that have been raised by the community in regards to proposed amendment rule 1469. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize that the proposed amendment is an overall strengthening. Um, as we look at all of the different provisions, uh, there's uh, all of the provisions are, are strengthening in terms of the existing Rule 1469. Staff is committed and it's built into uh, Proposed Amendment Rule 1469 a schedule uh, to reevaluate the chemical fume suppressants. Uh, and by January 2020, we need to make a determination if the chemical fume suppressants can be recertified, uh, this would include emissions testing uh, and looking at the health effects. We will be working with CARB, uh, who would also be working with OEHA as we move forward in this process. If the chemical fume suppressants can be certified, uh, facilities would be able to continue using them. If they're not recertified, facilities would then have three options. Option one, uh, staff would look at 
uh, low cost options for, for the facilities and then would certify it similar to like a steam suppressant certification. Uh, and so the facility wouldn't be subject to the periodic source testing, but we would look at uh, options that possibly would not even be add on pollution controlled. The second option would be the installation of pollution controls, and we've committed to, and it's in the board resolution, uh, that we would seek funding uh, to provide assistance for these small users. And then the third option is uh, facilities have the option and, and have an additional year, and then we also added an, uh, another provision that gives them a, the possibility of an additional one-year time extension to phase out the use of hexavalent chrome. So just to reemphasize the need for 1469, we're really just, we're trying to get to the finish line. Uh, we have a number of unregulated tanks that need pollution controls. Uh, the rule is, has periodic source testing, but it has a frequency of every five to seven years uh, to minimize the cost associated with this. Building enclosure requirements uh, in regards to minimizing the, the cross draft and um, those uh, openings that are near sensitive receptors. And send us to phase out uh, hexavalent chrome, giving folks additional time to do that, and then a schedule and a potential ban of the chemical fuel suppressants with the PFAS. Staff is recommending that we bring this item back uh, as a public hearing item in November. And um, I just uh, one last point is that we did meet with the metal finishers this this week. Uh, they had three requests. Uh, one request was uh, time in regards to if there's a a, a permitting issue with the city. We explained that there's already, we had already added in the September version a time extension of one year, so uh, they were comfortable with that. Second request was for a provision for uh, small tanks that were less than four square feet. Uh, we went back and did some emissions calculations, and, and um, if they can keep the use of those tanks down to less than two and a half hours per week uh, and using it within a, a certain temperature range. Uh, that we that it's the same emissions as a uh, uncontrolled uh, like a heated so the uncontrolled uh, emission limit or the controlled emission limit uh, that we're requiring in the rule. And then the third request was they wanted to expand the the band in regards to the uh, tier two tanks. Uh, but we explained that we already have a provision that allows someone to test out. They can do a source test on a what what is a uh, meets the requirements of a tier three. But if their emissions are meet the level of a tier two, then they uh, would be exempt from that. So that, um, so I think there, we're probably in a, hopefully in a pretty good place with the Metal Finishing Association. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Very good. Thank you, staff, for such an excellent presentation and a great job on this. Um, at this time, we wouldn't take public comment. We have two public commenters, uh, cards, uh, Wesley Turnbull and Florence Caribbean. So Wesley. Here. How does the final work? I got it. Paul's uh, Paul. <laughs> well, board members and staff, this uh, this one should be sweet, uh, short and sweet here. Wesley Turnbull with the Metal Finishing hey, Associations. Uh, uh, both of uh, Northern and Southern <coughs> California, and speaking on behalf of our national too, uh, we all got together and met this last week at a, at a board meeting, uh, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Fine and Susan Nakamura for meeting with us uh, so quickly. Uh, we had a meeting with them and, and said, here's some things that, you know, with our real sticklers, one we call these kind of lab tanks. Uh, and working with them, we've come to the point that we no longer oppose the amendment to rule 1469. We still have grave concerns about the economics. Uh, I, I think those three shops that you saw were speaking at the end were really speaking on behalf of these small shops. As an association at this point, we're no longer going to speak on their behalf. The board has agreed uh, unanimously as the metal finishing of Southern California that we do not oppose. Um, again, the economic concerns are still rather large for us. I'm always kind of happy to, to talk through them at any point they loom. Um, this is just one rule of many rules, and 1% uh, is conservatively <coughs> matters, and we think you can't get to that 1% because you can't get those really low loans. You can't even get a loan to do pollution equipment, and you're not going to amortize it over you know, 15 years if you do. But that being said, here we are. We're in a good spot. I want to talk uh, personally just for a minute. 
I've got at EME, um, like we've had monitoring for almost two years at our facility. When there were two monitors, uh, upwind and a downwind, there was 0.0, not, uh, not zero, but 0, 0.0 change between those monitors on average. Meaning that, and the wind blows continually, you can see with the smokestack that's on the upwind one of a refinery that's never stops. Uh, you know, there's, there's rare, rare moments in the morning when there's not wind, but it's always blowing and there's no change between those monitors. Recently, we, you know, many months ago, they took down one of the monitors. Uh, and it, of course, was the upwind. So now we don't have a proof of what's coming into our facility. And yet we have had for almost a year a monitor by itself. Uh, I would like to know, and I would like some help from the board when that monitor will go away. What's the purpose of it at this point? Because whenever it's around one, we have an AQMD inspector come in, ask for all these records, and it happens you know, every month or two, and it's rather harassing and a pain in the neck. We have to get together all these paint records. It's not a small thing. But I don't know what the purpose is, because when we had two monitors, we were showing we were nothing. Now we have one. Whenever they shoot off in the, you know, either the refinery or the Alameda corridor, which is right next to us, or a burning car, which happened last week on the street in front of the monitor. Whenever all those things happen, somebody comes in. Uh, love to have your help on that. Thanks, staff. Away we go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Florence Caribbean with the Del Amo Action Committee. And I do have continuing comments on the rule. However, I do also appreciate comments that Dr. Fine may, made during the board hearing on the rule regarding the necessity for getting this online. The concerns we continue to have are related to the use of fume suppressants. That is an emergent emerging issue that we're very concerned about, enclosure of these units to make sure that that really happens, clear emission limits, time frames for source tests, but under the arching issue of working toward eliminating hex chrome from use. I also want to add our appreciation for the addition of schools in the identification of sensitive receptors we are a little disappointed there, there was no language regarding parks that are located in these communities. And would like to see if some additional thought could be given to that topic. Thank you so much for all the hard work of the district on this issue. And we pray and hope that this rule will result in a reduction of hex chrome emissions. And ultimately, we hope the chemical can be eliminated from use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence. That's all the cards that I have, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Do we have any other speakers? Is that it on the speakers? Do we have any uh, comments by any of my board colleagues? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair? Uh, um, yes. I'm right here. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the, just if you can go over uh, why we didn't do anything on parks. I just want to understand very quickly. So uh, we on did parks. consider parks um, and we talked to OEHA in, in regards to the definition of sensitive receptors and, and parks. And um, the um, discussion with, with them was that uh, there's kind of a sort of a two prong approach. One would be that uh, that that particular location is predictable in terms of the uh, the people that would be going through that particular location, or that it would be something that would be long term. So a school, although it's short term, uh, is something that's predictable in terms of the the time that they would be there. Um, a hospital, it's not predictable, but then somebody could be there in terms of a, a care facility could be there for a long duration of time. So it didn't meet that you know either one of those. So uh, the discussion was that we that uh, they recommended, you know, it's not in the definition of sensitive receptors, and so we weren't comfortable in adding parks in there. Um, in the definition of sensitive receptor for a residential receptor, uh, the assumption is that folks that are living near uh, the facility that may be visiting a, a park, uh, that mm -hmm. the way the when we look at the health risk, it's assuming that the person is living. 
uh, at that residence but is outside. And so uh, we would be taking into account at that residential mm -hmm. receptor uh, that they would be, you know, outside, could be at the park, uh, and, you know, in, outdoors, essentially. Is there any way to maybe look at just a pilot effort? I mean, I don't know that there, how many parks are near these facilities. I mean, what's, you know, really, what's the number look like? Would it, would it be too much to ask if we just maybe attempted to put a sensor and just kind of gathered information and just to see what that looks like. What, what's happening right now is that we see a lot of people utilizing our parks at, at different times of the day as well. And I just, I, I'm just thinking back at my own experience with, hate to say it, Exide, where we actually had to clean up uh, a park that was almost a mile away. That's a little different, obviously, but nonetheless, communities need to know that they're safe. So I don't, I mean, I don't know what that cost would be, if any, but I would just want to ask staff if you could give me a sense of what that might look like. So there's a couple of issues, um, Supervisor. What I would say is let us um, consider it. But the first issue that comes to my mind is that you're looking at sort of state law and how do we comport, how we do risk assessment uh, from our own perspective as well as that of the state perspective. OEHA is a state agency that helps define these criteria, and we need to be consistent. The second issue that you raised, though, is you know what are the values in the parks themselves? You know, we do have our mate studies. We do go through the communities. Let us think about how this might be addressed. Maybe this is something that we could look at through the 617 process uh, as we right. go through that. So let us think about that and get back with you. OK, all right. And, and just one other quick question, again, and I know that um, Joe Lyons brought this up as well, is uh, because of the LA Times article that came out in October, does AQMD report facilities to Cal OSHA when violations uh, that, that may threaten worker safety? We have raised issues to Cal OSHA when we've had concerns and we've asked Cal OSHA to go into facilities and determine for themselves whether or not there were issues. So we do share with our other sister agencies uh, across the board when we have concerns. Do you know if they followed up uh, as a result of that, any referrals that you've made? Uh, we know that they did send in teams that they made investigations. Uh, I'm not, uh, in one investigation I'm aware that they concluded that there wasn't a workplace issue and on the other areas I'm not quite clear but we know that they do follow up and look at it. Do we collect any of that data? I mean to report back in any way can we ask for that? You know, that's generally mm -hmm. enforcement data that we're privy to. We generally don't share enforcement compliance data other than okay. level. All right just asking the question. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Fellow board members, Mr. please go ahead. I'll comment. Sure. First, first I uh, want to thank our staff for all the work they did on this rule. And they actually visited every facility that wanted to. There were only a few that didn't. And really worked with each facility in a sort of tailored fashion to take care of their problems and assure them of uh, cost effectiveness and how this, how this can be done. I also want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Turnbull and the um, Metal Association for working with us on this and finding uh, a good solution. It's really important that we get this rule in place. This is a very toxic chemical. It does affect our communities and the health of our communities. And uh, I'm very anxious to get it uh, set, for, uh, set for hearing. I would also suggest this is the fourth time or the third time? <laughs> no. <laughs> Second hearing. Yeah. I would also suggest that after the rule is passed, that we have it come back to stationary stores for review. I don't know what that time period would be. Would it be a year? Or you might uh, have a staff suggest what, what would be. Three months. Yeah. If you want to look at it after some controls are in place, maybe two years, I would think. So. I, I would suggest maybe annual. We'll okay. come back in 12 months. <laughs> in 12 months. 
you know, I may not be here in two years. <laughs> I'm going to see how it's going. <laughs> so anyway, come back uh, in, a, in a year after we after the rule gets passed to see how the um, progress is going. Very good. Joe? Dr. Luke? I didn't want it to come back to stationary source committee meetings. So Ever. I, I don't have any well, then you're not allowed to bring anything up then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions uh, from staff or from uh Mayor, there's uh, apparently one additional comment if you're so inclined. You know, I'm sorry, we already took public comment, and I believe that uh, part of the time has passed, and we need to move on to the other two items that are on the agenda. I appreciate you coming down, but we, unless staff uh, tells me otherwise, if we, can we move on? Barbara? Yeah, if you could maybe talk offline with staff afterwards or talk with Dr. Lou, that'd be great, but we just, we've got two more very important items we still need to get through. All right, any other board member comments? Yeah. My only other comment is I really, uh, we need to make sure when this gets to the agendized meeting in November that we have plenty of time for that very well done presentation. Susan, take your time with it. Don't, no need to rush. We need to make sure all of our other board colleagues get the, uh, the full brief of what we've been doing with, dealing with here at Station Resource. I think you've made, uh, got a great presentation to bring that forward to them. So thank you for all your hard work. All right, with that we'll move on to item two, the proposed amended rules for 14 or 1146, the emissions of oxides and nitrogens from industrial and, uh, boilers. So Tracy, go ahead and get us started. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm pleased to come to the committee today to present our proposed amendments to rule 1146 series, 1146, 1146.1, and rule 1146.2 as well as our new rule, uh, proposed rule 1100, which will establish the implementation schedule for the facilities that are gonna be transitioning out of the reclaim program. Uh, as a little bit of way of background, uh, the 1146 series rules apply to boilers, process heaters, and steam generators. Um, this is part of our uh, reclaim transition process that came out of the 2016 AQMP. But I do wanna highlight that this is really the first big group of of equipment that we're going to be looking at establishing BART in conjunction with AB 617. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, there are, uh, with the three rules, there are a series of size of equipment that those rules apply to. We do have proposals for rule M46, M46.1, and then we have a, uh, an assessment that we want to do in conjunction with rule M46.2. For rule M46 and the M46.1, uh, if you'll recall, we did come to the board and we're looking to uh, have a public hearing earlier this year. Uh, based on the comments that we received, uh, staff went back and conducted a more thorough and actually we were able to get a lot more technical information with regards to our BART assessment. Um, as a part of this, uh, we are proposing some tighter limits um, in conjunction with some of this equipment that's affected by these rules, <coughs> including an ammonia slip limit of 5 ppm. Um, just to highlight, there are equipment that would otherwise apply to these rules from refineries and electrical generating facilities, but those are going to have industry-specific rules that will apply to those. So the, the limits that we're talking about today would not apply to them. And then, as I said, we'll have an implementation schedule in Rule 1100. Uh, for Rule M46, as you can see here, there is a range of equipment uh, that we're proposing to, um, when you look at the current limits and the proposed limits, we are looking at tightening some of those limits in particular for some of the fire tube type boilers. Um, we are, uh, we do have a proposal and we're going to talk more about that with regards to landfills. Um, as you can see on the right column in, in terms of our assessment for the tighter standards, um, everything is cost effective based on our analysis. For rule M46.1, it's really still the same. Uh, we have, do have a cost-effective analysis for some of the equipment. Uh, they'll be looking at, uh, upon burner replacement, they'll be looking at these costs or within 15 years of the amendment. Um, in all these cases, though, we are looking at cost-effective um, adjustments or uh, limits that are, that are going to be imposed on the facilities. For digester gas-fired units, I do want to highlight that we did look at tightening the limits for those. Uh, but in terms of, of tightening those limits and trying to go down to a lower level, it was not cost effective. So we're leaving that the same. For Rule 1146.2, we're not looking to change the concentration limit currently that's within that rule. We do want to conduct a technology assessment to be done by uh, January of 2022. Um, if it turns out 
that um, the BART is going to be uh, more feasible to go down to a lower, lower level. We will do that and we'll establish an implementation schedule. If not, we'll just leave the rule alone and keep the 30 ppm limit. Um, when we look at Rule 1100, uh, for Rule 1146 and 1146.1, of course, we want to do a phased implementation that is consistent with what we've done previously with amendments to Rule 1146. So once they submit their applications, we do have a phased implementation for 75% of the total heat input by 2021 and then the remainder by 2022. This will allow the facilities flexibility in, in uh, implementing the requirements of the proposed rules. Um, we do have that additional year under that compliance option uh, to get to that 100%. Uh, units that are close to the NOx emissions limit can comply upon the burner replacement or the 15 years, as I mentioned. When it comes to the monitoring, record keeping, and reporting requirements for Title V, that will remain the same. But for the non-Title V facilities, uh, they will uh, follow the MRR requirements that are specified within Rule 146 and Rule 146.1. When you look at the emission reductions associated with these rules, I mean, we're talking about um, up to uh, 300 different types of units that are going to be uh, implementing these requirements. We're looking at a 0.27 ton per day reduction by 2023. For the landfill gas units, which I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, we're looking at 0.07 tons per day. Um, but we do have an additional reduction to 0.04 tons per day from the non-reclaimed natural gas-fired units uh, by the 15 years after rule replacement or rule amendment. For the landfill gas units, we do have two closed landfills that, that are inactive, but they are uh, processing the gas. Uh, these landfills actually have very large boilers compared to some of the other units that are under reclaim. One is about 115 million BTU, and the other in another landfill, uh, both those boilers are over 300 million BTU. So if you look at the permitted levels, they are quite high when you compare to everything else. Uh, when you look at the permitted levels for all the other reclaimed sources. But we do want to highlight that this gas must be managed in some way, shape, or form, um, that over time the, the quality of the gas declines, and in some cases they may need natural gas for flame stabilization. Uh, we are continuing to work with uh, the landfill industry as well as uh, the other publicly owned treatment works with regards to implementing these requirements. Uh, we do acknowledge that there are some inherent difficulties associated with controlling the emissions from these sources. For new source review, this is something that we've, that we've talked about before. Um, we have had comments that, you know, we shouldn't move forward until we resolve the NSR issues. As you've heard before, you know, we have AB 617 that requires us to move forward with BART. We need to do that. We need to move forward with that. And we need to provide certainty to the facilities as they move forward and complying with that, not only complying with the BART requirements, but also uh, for the facilities that are, are working towards meeting their shave obligations under the reclaim program from 2015, where we adopted that 12 ton per day shave. So for in rule 2002, do want to highlight, as we discussed at the last board meeting, the facilities have the option to stay in reclaim and still function under reclaim while the BART schedule is moving forward. Uh, with dual fuel, fuel units, uh, we have had some concerns with regards to the 7 ppm NOx limit. Uh, we do have information from the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District that uh, units are able to meet the dual fuel requirements, so we don't have any uh, real concerns there. We are going to continue to work with the sources and continue to uh, get information from San Joaquin Valley. So with that, Mr. Chair, we are planning on uh, requesting that we set the hearing on November 2nd for December and have a December public hearing. With that, Mr. Chair, I uh, would be happy to answer any questions. Very good. Do we have public comment on this item? We have three cards here in Diamond Bar. Okay. Proceed. Go ahead and take that. Okay. David uh, Rothbart, followed by Allison Torres, and then Terry on. Just to help with what I'm going to discuss, here's a couple of show and tell pictures for you. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Rothbart, and I'm representing the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts rather than SCAP on this item. Uh, other speakers will, <clears throat> will be providing comments on behalf of SCAP. The sanitation districts and SCAP have participated in every working group meeting for these rules, which commenced in November 2017. I asked very early on if biogas limits would be addressed in the proposed rules, and staff indicated <clears throat> that biogas boilers would not be included in these amendments. It was our understanding that these rules were only 
being amended for reclaim facilities. However, on August 29, 2018, staff noted that revised biogas limits would be included in the 75-day board package. This was the first notice we were provided about any change in the limits for biogas boilers. As a result, we've had very little time to assess the impact of the proposed rule. I'd like to stress that biogas is not natural gas. I want to say that again. Biogas is not natural gas. So any comparison between our biogas facilities and reclaim facilities is like comparing apples to grapefruits. Landfill gas is a low BTU gas produced from the decomposition of waste and contains impurities. This waste gas must be managed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The sanitation districts operate the Pointy Hills landfill, and we have successfully beneficially used the gas at this facility to generate renewable power for many years, and this facility's NOx emissions are lower than those of biogas engines and turbines. It's very low emissions. The sanitation district strongly object to the assertions made by staff indicating that the Pointy Hills landfill can cost-effectively retrofit our boilers. This is a closed landfill, and the quality and quantity of landfill gas continues to decline, and over time, the poor gas quality will cause this facility to close on its own in about 10 years. As shown in the photos I just distributed, the burners for these facilities are very unusual. They're about six feet in diameter. There are no replacement burners available from any vendor, so it's impossible at this time to determine the cost effectiveness to retrofit for this facility. We're not sure if we could achieve the proposed 20 ppm limit because of flame stability issues as the gas quality continues to decline. However, we are willing to install a natural gas line and assess whether we can achieve the proposed 20 ppm limit. We request the applicability of the proposed landfill gas limit be subject to a one-year natural gas flame stabilization study for this unique facility to ensure the 20 ppm limit is achievable. Thank you very much for your consideration. Chair, do you want staff to address that now, or do you want to wait until after the conclusion of public comment? Let's take all the public comment, and then we'll have stra staff address all of it at the end. I'll take it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Allison Torres. Can you hear me? With Eastern, oh, I'm sorry. I'm representing SCAP, the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works, as well as Eastern Municipal Water District. Um, SCAP members have various beneficial use uh, projects that utilize dual fuel boilers um, to operate and support the wastewater process. Uh, it's our, as David Rothbart mentioned, it's our understanding that these rules were only being amended to incorporate reclaim facilities. Um, however, the proposed limit reduction for digester gas boilers um, operated on natural gas will affect our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, staff indicated in their report that the digester gas dual fuel limit has been achieved in San Joaquin APCD for a dual fuel boiler that also utilizes natural gas. Although we requested documentation to verify that these limits were achieved, we have lim received limited information. Due to time constraints, SCAP did uh, contact San Joaquin APCD, and we did confirm that there was one dual fuel boiler that issued a permit, but it was issued at 9 ppm, uh, not 7 ppm. That's in the um, proposal by staff. Also, um, San Joaquin rules do not require um, do not prohibit tuning prior to any testing, um, which is the case in South Coast. Accordingly, we are concerned that any dual fuel boiler in San Joaquin is not a apples to apples comparison with uh, boilers in South Coast. It's not practical to um, switch between fuels uh, for the, this equipment um, and stop our process. So we are concerned about the 7 ppm limit for uh, natural gas on dual fuel boilers. So on behalf of SCAP and EMWD, uh, we request that the limits for uh, dual fuel boilers that also, when they utilize natural gas, um, remain the 9 ppm for fire two. Thank you for your consideration. Good morning, my name is Terry Ann, and I'm representing Orange County Sanitation District. Um, OCSC owns and operates three large uh, boilers that will be impacted by proposed amended rule 1146. These boilers are used to provide additional heating um, to our thermophilic digesters, especially during cooler months. All three are dual fuel boilers that primarily burn digester gas but natural gas can be um, used when there's not enough supply of digester gas. Unlike the dual fuel coal-fired 
um, boilers, which can burn both gases at the same time, our dual fluid boilers can burn only one fuel at a time. So also unlike the dual fuel coal fire boilers, our dual fuel boilers are subject to separate NOx limits. So it's 15 ppm when it's on uh, digester gas and mm -hmm. 9 ppm NOx when it's burning natural gas. The need to uh, switch between the gases uh, as extra challenge to the operation of the ultra low burners like we have. Um, so two of our boilers have recently been re retrofitted to meet mm -hmm. these limits, which became effective just over three years ago in 2015. The third boiler is a new replacement. Uh, boiler is installed also to comply with these limits. So staff introduced these uh, proposed limits on digester gas, as uh, David mentioned, late in the rulemaking process um, on August 29th. Um, and it came as a big surprise to our SCAP members. So there were no prior discussions on the proposed limits on, on digester gas. So since then, staff had, uh, has agreed to, um, to keep the limits for the digester gas at 15 ppm. But our dual, foiler, uh, dual fuel boilers will still be subject to proposed limit of 7 ppm NOx for when it's burning natural gas. And we're concerned about the ability for dual fuel boilers to achieve that proposed limit. We, so we request staff to conduct a detailed review of actual installations that have been demonstrated to achieve proposed NOx limit on natural gas on dual fuel boilers using retrofitted burners. And finally, until the viability of the 7 ppm NOx uh, burners for dual fuel boilers are fully vetted, we request that the limits for dual fuel boilers remain at 9 ppm when burning natural gas and 15 ppm when burning digester gas. Thank you. That's it in terms of public comment. Any other public comments in any other locations? All right, we're going to close public comment. Uh, staff, can you go ahead and address uh, those, it sounds like very large concerns from our, our uh, biogas facilities? So, uh, Mr. Chair, this is Philip Fine. Uh, so this week, staff was discussing a lot of these concerns and we've been talking to a lot of the stakeholders and done a little soul searching. And I think we, 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 we have a possible way forward on this. And we're, we, we're constantly confronted as we're going through all these landing rules about the unique circumstances that exist at landfills, uh, which are often closed landfills that are declining quality of gas and declining gas, which raises some cost effectiveness issues, as well as the publicly owned treatment works, which uh, have unique situations, uh, including potentially increased gas production through the, their digest utilization of their digesters, both of which can't turn off the gas. They have to manage the gas while other facilities have other options whether as, as they're bringing gas into the facility uh, for other reasons. So staff is uh, strongly considering, uh, just like we're doing for refineries and power plants in terms of a sector-specific rule uh, as, as things get uh, transitioned out of reclaiming. Uh, in this case, they're not necessarily in reclaim, but looking at a sector-specific rule to address all these issues. So what that would mean in, in 1146 and some rules coming up like 1134 and 1110.2 is to change the applicability and maybe some exemptions to uh, essentially remove all these issues that the publicly owned treatment works and the landfills are having and deal with them separately and holistically in a more sector specific rule uh, that we think we can address these issues in a, in a, in a much better way. So uh, that's that's. What staff is thinking, we think that's a, a positive way forward, uh, and we won't continue to get into these issues while we try to jam all these different types of circumstances into a single landing rule. All right. Any board member questions on this item? Mr. Chairman, if I could comment. Please. Uh, first, I need to say that I. Um, don't have a conflict of interest or any financial interest, but I am an alternate board member on LA County Sanitation District Board. Okay. So um, I think uh, the idea that Dr. Fine has presented is a very good one. Um, these are different uh, from some of the other industrial facilities we deal with. And um, they do provide essential public services as well. And I think they should be treated differently. Um, 
the amount of benefit that we get from some of these uh, new regulations is not that great and in comparison to the cost that some of these facilities would face. And so I do think we ought to look at it separately and consider how we might uh, how we might address them. And I I would take them out of this 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 rule and put them into another category. That would be my recommendation to to our staff. Yeah. I think that's a great recommendation, I, and I tend to lean the same way. We've got uh, these are critical facilities. We need to figure out how to make this cost effective for them especially when we know their facilities are going to have to be shutting down in uh, limited amounts of time. Any other board member comments? Yeah, if I, I could, Mr. Chair, um, you said Please. the, the emission reductions from this are <coughs> counted toward uh, the AQMP commitment, CMB05, I think it was, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a much larger commitment. I assume there's a bunch of other rules that are going to get us the five tons per day that we're committed to on that. Yeah, I, I think Phil may want to add to that. What we're going to be doing as a part of the transition is looking at overall to make ensure that we're meeting our 12 ton per day mm -hmm. reduction commitment. And then on top of that, as we yeah. go forward with implementing the control measure, we'll be looking to achieve the, the 5 ton per day. Okay, so it'll be a whole bunch of other rules that follow. And, and looking at all the reclaimed facilities as well. A bit of a drop in the bucket when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And pulling it out, the sector specific rule makes a lot of sense. Um, I know that the, the non-refinery flare is up next on the agenda, which relates to this, yep. um, because you know the one thing we don't want to do is just encourage them to take out any beneficial use of the gas and just burn them off, and that that would be uh, uh, the, the worst possible outcome. So let's try to work with them to figure something out. All right. Any other comments or questions? Very good. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to our, uh, our third item, the proposed rule 1118.1, the uh, non-refinery players. Michael. Good morning, Chairman. And, and the committee, yes. <laughs> and we hope that in, uh, in, in what Dr. Lewitt said, uh, that we have worked with these, uh, these same groups uh, together with a very robust working group. Let's jump in. Okay, so we're going to talk about proposed rule 1118.1. Uh, controlled emissions from non-refinery flares. Uh, but we have background. Uh, these gases are being produced by uh, landfills, wastewater treatment plants, oil production facilities, but also things like uh, uh, bulk loading, uh, loading to tank degassing, things like that. Uh, there are some beneficial use you can get from these gases. You can uh, put those into turbines, microturbines, fuel cells, create energy. Uh, you can re-inject back into the pipeline to be reused and cleaned up for, uh, for use by uh, the gas company. But also could be uh, can also be compressed and cleaned up and used as a transportation fuel. Just as a reminder, these are typically uh, controlled devices. Uh, these flares are combusting methane and VOCs to reduce emissions, but as a result, they also generate NOx emissions. And that's what our focus of concern is. So let's talk about the regulatory background. Currently, we have no source-specific rule for non-refinery flares. If a new flare, someone comes in with a new flare application, they are subject to our best available control uh, technology or BACT. Uh, but what's really drawing this, the need for this new rule is that EPA has listed this as part of our RAC RACM analysis in our last AQMP. Uh, just as a reminder of what that means. So RACM is reasonably available control technology or control measure, which is the CM part of it. And what that does is EPA basically says, look, other people are doing, other people are regulating these sources. You're an extreme non-attainment. You need to be focused on, on regulating them as well. Uh, currently in California, there are two uh, air districts adopt, ha, that have adopted flare rules uh, for these types of sources. Um, and as a matter of fact, we know San Joaquin is actually re-looking at their current rule, and they are following and tracking this rule as we, as we discuss this to uh, decide how they want to also move forward uh, with their current rule. Uh, just a, another reminder, in our AQMP, we did list this as one of our controlled measures. Uh, and, it actually, and actually, because some of these facilities our reclaim facilities, uh, we also fall under our reclaim control measure. Okay, so we did initiate this uh, rulemaking effort back in April 2017. We had a really great working group from all the different affected sources, and people really came to those working group meetings uh, providing really interesting stories. Uh, they invited us out to uh, site visits, so we actually went to all the different affected sources, we went to 20 of those. 
uh, over that time period, and we got some really good feedback. We also, at those work group meetings, we invited alternative technology groups to come and have conversations, and we saw a lot of business cards being exchanged, and we know we've had visits at those facilities to kind of talk, so people are serious about uh, making change and doing the right thing. Of course, we want, we want this all to be a win-win approach. During that rulemaking process, just to kind of give you uh, 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 perspective, uh, we did actually start out much different than what the rule we're presenting here today. We originally thought, hey, let's just go for the old flares. And then we learned, like, you know, just because a flare itself in the shell is old, a lot of times they've, they've renovated that. They've changed out burners. They've reduced emission rates, et cetera. So we couldn't necessarily just go by an age of something to make that determination that it's a bad actor, shall we say. Uh, and then we went on to another concept. We said, hey, how about some target goals for beneficial use? So a facility could say, could map out where they want to go. But there was concerns with that on whether, whether they could have those goals and still meet them and whether they would be in violation if not meeting them. So we needed to come up with a new idea. And what we came up with was this idea of a capacity threshold. So basically facilities have existing flares out there. How much are they using of that flare? And would there be a way we could determine the usage of that flare being routine? And remember, that was one of the, that was one of the overarching goals of the rule, was to minimize routine flaring. We also then obviously want to minimize our emission reductions. That's why we're here. That's the goal of the agency. But we also want to encourage beneficial use. We do want to, as we move in and with all these rules and regs, we do need to look at more of these women approaches that are going to encourage facilities to do the right thing and also to benefit themselves. Uh, so we established a, a capacity threshold. We'll talk about it in a little detail in a second here. Uh, again, those thresholds were meant to be achieving maximum emission reductions, but also to allow a time frame by which companies can make smart decisions for themselves and especially in choosing a beneficial use for their gas handling. Okay, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about about 146 facilities that operate about 288 flares. Landfills tend to be the greatest number of those flares. You'll see in the pie chart there on the right, on the bottom end there, you'll see the number of the landfill uh, gas flares we're discussing, both in open landfills as well as closed, and there are the other affected sources on the top. One little slice of that pie there in the, uh, in the rust burnt orange, I don't know what you call that color, um, is, is called, it's considered other flaring. Again, these are the type of flarings that you see uh, when the tanks are unloading, they need to be degassing or marine terminals, etc. So we wanted to make sure we addressed them as well. This is an, uh, sort of a, another characterization of these different types of, uh, of source categories, uh, the type, different types of, again, number of facilities, number of flares. But we wanted to sort of highlight here um, sort of uh, what I would consider like a characteristic of those types of facilities. So for example, in wastewater and landfill, these types of facilities have a, pretty much a constant gas production. Right? A lot of times, like the landfills, uh, as you know, we've required uh, gas collection to reduce odors, and then you then have to handle that gas. So there's going to be a constant production on that. This is a little different than in oil and gas production, by which a facility could is really concerned about the gas when they're extracting the oil, right? Gas comes up with the oil when they're making that production level. And, and oil and gas facilities then have the ability, because they're just doing this production at, at, on their own time frame, that they can actually shut down if they have an issue. On the wastewater landfill side, they're dealing with a, what we would consider, I believe it was mentioned just recently in this a testimony here, about what they would consider a low quality gas. And thus, that would mean that they have to do a high level of cleanup in order to utilize that in a beneficial way. Uh, this is a little different for oil and gas, because they're actually bringing up quite high quality uh, gas with a little less cleanup uh, and thus corresponding costs. On the wastewater end, we notice that it's a high energy intensive operation. So it's really beneficial for a lot of them. And what we've seen on our site visits, a lot of them have progressed to a lot of beneficial uses uh, with their gas. Uh, and it benefits them in, again, providing energy production. Um, with the, with the uh, landfills, we found their, their challenge is dealing with the closed landfill. Again, mentioned earlier, when you're talking about closed landfills, quality of gas goes down. Actually, the level of gas goes down and then how to handle those. So we wanted to address that also in this rule. And on the oil and gas, what we found is because the concern of large air pockets doesn't always happen during oil production, but could happen, they get quite concerned about that. So they tend to, to install high capacity um, uh, flares. And of course, we were thinking about that, and that's very important because when we're looking at a capacity threshold, that needs to take into consideration. 
our general approach uh, to the rule was to look at both new and existing flares. We wanted to design it in a way that uh, created uh, a compliant, that create compliance options that we encourage that beneficial use. And one of the things we found out from the working group really had to deal with time, time, time. It wasn't that a lot of the working group folks didn't want to do beneficial use. It was more of a matter of, is it cost effectiveness, and will we have enough time to do the proper planning, get the municipal approvals, things like that, to make that work. So again, we took that in consideration in building the rule. We also wanted to take in consideration the operational constraints, as we mentioned before, between the different facilities. And then, of course, there's different types of costs, as I noted earlier, maybe for cleanup, et cetera. On the right there, in those two tables, you'll see that what we wanted to do if someone exceeded that capacity threshold, the different options or routes they would take. So one, for example, would just go out and replace with a cleaner flare. And we created a period of time, what we thought was a reasonable period of time, uh, to do that in installation. One of the biggest uh, hurdles they found was actually, actually probably comes from us. Uh, it's dealing with the permit <laughs> or the CEQA at the time to do the CEQA evaluation. So we constructed it in a way that said, well, let's make that trigger, that time trigger, based upon that permit issuance. And that sort of seemed to work more reasonably for them. When it comes to flare reduction, it's a challenge. Uh, some projects might take a quicker time frame, some longer. So we wanted to keep in mind what a reasonable time frame would be, uh, but also to provide uh, an extension. They would have to make a request for a reasonable extension uh, with us to make that happen, to ensure that the project uh, eventually occurs. OK, let's dive a little deeper, more specifically. So what we're proposing for, like, for a new flare, uh, we set out a series of emission limits. We base these limits upon what is our current major source BAT limits. So as I noted earlier, for a new flare, you come in, you're already subject currently to BAT. We wanted to push the envelope a little bit further by saying that we believe that these BAT limits for major sources could, could be accomplished by both major and minor sources. And you'll hear from us today as well some testimony about concerns with that. Um, but basically, that was, that, was, that was what we set the stage on if you came in for a new flare or to replace. Uh, this, again, is the state-of-the-art technology. These have been achieved in practice out there. Uh, but we do believe these are cost-effective. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, for on the existing flare side. So on this side, what we were looking to have, have operations do is take account of their, their uh, capacity, again, uh, their capacity usage of that flare and whether they're exceeding their specific threshold. We came up with different thresholds for different types of sources. So there on the right table, you'll see how we identify the different types of gases, for example, like a digester gas, you'll see by those in wastewater treatments. Uh, and then you'll see landfill as well as one for oil and gas. Then you'll see different thresholds. Those are the thresholds by which we believe if you were operating and handling your gas in those specific types of source categories, that is the threshold that would define you as routine gas. You're flaring, at a, you're flaring routinely. Um, and as you noted, that there's a different range for that. And there's a number of reasons uh, because this is occurring. Uh, for example, uh, it might be because on the digester side, that there's a very low amount of emissions that are coming out from the, digest, uh, from the, uh, from the wastewater. A lot of them are doing beneficial already. <clears throat> so that gives them a higher level of routine flaring uh, allowed, unlike maybe something like landfills, as we discussed earlier, being more of a larger source. OK, so they take account and do some record keeping for consecutive two years. Now, you may ask, why two years? Well, the concern for the working group was that one year, there might be, let's shall we say, a hiccup, some sort of problem that comes along that uh, gives them an exceedance of their capacity threshold within a one-year time frame. And they sort of wanted to feel that they should be given an, a, a, a clearance for that. And we didn't want to go through the process of having to decide the yay or nay on that. So therefore, we decided, let's go ahead and give them two consecutive years. When you do two consecutive years, that should pretty much firm up that this would be considered routine flaring. And thus, one, we would want you to take some kind of action. OK, when it comes to, and there's the action pieces. So you don't exceed, no action. You do exceed, we, we, uh, we seek you to take some kind of route. If you don't replace your flare, by the way, and you want to uh, try to reduce your flare down below that threshold, we would, we would encourage then, that would be the encouragement to go down the beneficial, beneficial route. We don't require it. We just require that threshold. But that would be a reasonable option. We wanted to do that to build that flexibility that all of these uh, affected industries were seeking. 
Now, when it came to other flaring, we found new challenges. As we went out to the different sites, as we talked to the experts in the field, we talked about their operations, we found a number of things. One of these, these other flaring, again, this is like marine terminal, tank degassing, tank unloading, et cetera. There were low volumes. They tend to be a diverse gas stream, which was also difficult for them to do with our record keeping. Uh, but also there were limited beneficial use opportunities, and that might do with like, where they're located and how they operate. So, oh, to, to put a cap on that. So therefore, we did, not help, we did not hold other flaring to the capacity thresholds. However, we are holding the other flaring that if they come in to make that change, to be subject to uh, the, uh, the new emission limits. Okay, there's just some other uh, rule requirements here. We've, we've seen all these before. Source testing, monitoring, record review, reporting. We've added some exemptions for low use and low emitting, as well as closed landfills. Uh, we put, it, we put a, a limit on those. We recognize that closed landfills. Uh, we do want to put a limit on this, because some closed landfills might close and be at a high flow rate, and they should then be concerned about what they're doing out there and handling the gas. But when they reach a certain point, it's not much of an air quality concern. This kind of gives you a quick overview then of those number of flares, how they break out in the different industries. There's an inventory value that's based on a three-year average between 2015 to 2017. As you may have noted, this is a lot lower than what we saw in the AQMP, but mind you, it was a different value in the AQMP. We were looking at a base year of 2012. There's the number of impacted flares we believe that will be currently be impacted, but mind you, this rule is written for also future compliance. So facilities will continue to do their record keeping, and in the future, as we look at growth in this industry, because we are talking about increasing population, landfills, whatever, that um, there could be others that we don't see today being affected, could be affected in the future. This just sort of noted some of those things I think I've already uh, highlighted with regards to the number of affected flares, uh, whether the cost of, of a flare that does vary between those industries, beneficial uses are their choices, some of the reductions, again, we presented here, uh, we hopefully be seeing. To just cap some of the some of the key concerns, things you might hear today. One was about if a minor, if you come in as a minor source, the ability to be able to continue using the point, what I'll just classify as the point zero six uh, flare instead of the point zero two five flare that we're, we're, we're looking to see in the in the rule. Uh, some of the thoughts there was if we were to allow point zero six, we would like to cap that. We would like to put something, let's say, like an a yearly hourly amount or something. Um, but when it comes sure, to this, remember just very quickly. Very quickly, I, I, I can't see the screen anymore on my end. Just want to give oh. you a heads up. Okay, Paul. Thoughts? Continue your continue your presentation. Okay. But maybe <laughs> the slides are black. Someone can fix that. No, we're getting it out we're here. Shane, you have good colors on this one. Okay. Uh, one more slide. We are for slide fourteen. Just noting the key concerns here. Another issue was raised is there, you're gonna, there are some facilities that would be affected by the way the, the construct of the rule. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they look at these, when they look at their individual facilities, they believe that they would they would be fiscally burden burdensome to them. But this sometimes happens with some of our rules, right? Where it's cost effective overall as a rule, but some might be more impacted by others. Uh, and then finally, there was. Um, the thought of really pushing more for the oil and gas. They, there's more uh, opportunities for them and uh, to, uh, to really incentivize them to move into beneficial use. And we don't disagree. Okay, finally, there's a schedule to uh, continue to work with the stakeholders. There's very few issues that we believe we have left. We're almost there. Um, and again, we really compliment our working group that has really been helpful in this process. Set here in public hearing. And that concludes my presentation. Bye. Very good. Please uh, stand by, Raymond. We have uh, public comments on this. Uh, Joe, you want to get the public comments going? Yeah. Looks like we've got seven opposed comments here, at least. Uh, Michael Salman first, and then David Rothbart next. Do we have a timer there in CCA? Yes, we do. We do. Um, I hate to do this, but we, we've got it only about 30 minutes or less than that, 25 minutes left. So let's go to a minute and a half on the comments. Please keep it as. Uh, my, my numbers, four of them will probably be a, a minute, so it won't be as long as you think that. We're getting okay. a, we're getting a <laughs> commitment that some <laughs> will be shorter than three minutes. They yeah. said a minute instead of a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> for some of them, but they, they would like for discretion. All right, go ahead and call the first name, Joe, and let's, let's get through this. Please, please be as brief as you can. 
Yes. I'm Michael Salmon. I'm a professor of history at UCLA, where for the past four or five years I've worked on, on history and public policy of the oil industry in Los Angeles and the surrounding region. Uh, in 2015, I assisted the World Bank in reaching out to Governor Brown to get Governor Brown to be the first governor of a U.S. state to sign on to the World Bank's zero routine flaring initiative to achieve zero routine flaring at oil well sites by 2030. In December 2015, the governor signed on to that initiative. And then I brought word of that um, back here to AQMD. I participated in several of the meetings and ultimately the, uh, spoke at the board meeting where the board approved the 2016 AQMP with um, CMB03 that called for prioritizing beneficial use. Um, the AQMP also indicated the likely need to disaggregate source categories. It was very clear about that. I spoke about that at the AQMP. So I want to thank the board for the AQMP. Unfortunately, the rule writing group spent uh, more than four months um, resisting disaggregating the source categories, which led to oodles of time spent um, rehearsing yet again and again and again the vast differences between landfill and wastewater treatment plants on the one hand and oil well sites on the other. So I'm here to say I don't think this rule is ready. I would like to see it delayed, especially as concerns oil and gas sites. The AQMP um, at, uh, suggested prioritizing beneficial use. The proposed rule actually does the opposite. The proposed rule pre predictably would lead to a massive expansion of flaring in the oil sector. The oil sector is cyclical since 2014. It's been in a downswing. We're now um, a hair's breadth away from an uh, international political trigger jumping oil prices. Oil prices will resume an upward swing on their own cyclical basis. And at that time, um, the oil industry will increase the number of flares. It increases flares and it goes for high capacity flares, not um, only or even mainly because of gassy pack pockets when drilling for oil, which would only produce a temporary need for a flare. Um, in 2012 and 2013, the oil industry significantly increased the number of flares that it requested permitting for in the district in response to SoCal Gas uh, Rule 30. There were changes to that rule that made it more difficult to market locally produced gas. SoCal Gas will continue to make its uh, SoCal Gas composition rule more stringent. Most of our gas that we use in state comes from out of state and therefore producers in the region will seek ever larger flare flares. The capacity threshold um, uh, measure would uh, induce gaming the system. If you just install more and larger flares, you stay at a lower threshold. There's nothing there about new permitting. There's nothing to limit the increase of flaring in the future. I hope you send the rule back for more work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank Rothbard, you for your excellent comment. Followed by Steve Jepson. My name is David Rothbart, and I'm the SCAP Air Quality Committee Chair. I'd first like to thank staff for working with us on the proposed rule. While we appreciate their efforts, we remain troubled by the proposed back limits because they may be unable for us to comply with them. It was our understanding that the intent of this rule was to incentivize beneficial uses of biogas, but this rule only makes our mission of providing a safe, reliable, essential public service more difficult. Furthermore, we are confused about the purpose of this reclaim landing rule. Considering none of our members are in reclaim and the flaring emission inventory for wastewater treatment plants is minimal, Staff's presentation includes an exaggerated NOx emission inventory of 0.08 tons per day, but please note that most of this inventory has already been eliminated due to existing beneficial use projects. Some of our members have already installed ultra-low NOx flares proposed by this rule and have experienced reliability issues with this type of flare. Our Vice Chair, Allison Torres, will outline some of these issues in her comments. In addition to these issues, we were just informed a few weeks ago about potential problems caused by increasing food waste digestion or operating in a thermophilic mode at wastewater treatment plants. Steve Jepson, our executive director, will explain that wastewater treatment facilities throughout the state are very concerned that the proposed rule may negatively impact our ability to help California comply with SB 1383. My apologies for getting into the weeds, but we believe that it's important to outline our concerns. Perhaps the easiest way to illustrate the problem created by the proposed rule is to consider a hypothetical project, like CRNR in Paris, that will digest food waste and inject the resulting biogas into the natural gas pipeline. Although we now have a great beneficial use project for this hypothetical, 
intended to utilize all of the biogas generated, flares are still required in the event biogas treatment fails or maintenance is required. As drafted, the proposed rule would penalize such a project and require the installation of very complex and costly flares, which might not even be able to comply with the proposed limits. Considering these issues, we respectfully request that proposed Rule 1118.1 establish an achievable limit for flares until we could fully assess the potential impact of food waste and thermophilic digestion, specifically request the rule establish 0.06 pounds per million BTU limit and temporarily exempt food waste and thermophilic digesters. This is the first rule in the nation to limit biogas NOx emissions. We don't understand the need to immediately achieve the lowest levels in the world. This rule can be revised in the future when we better understand the impact of food waste and thermophilic digestion. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Excuse me, Dr. Lou. I just wanted to confirm with the chairman. Mr. Chairman, I thought you had specified a minute and a half for each speaker. I, I think what we, we agreed was that uh, several of these speakers are only going to take a minute. So far, they haven't Right. Done that. So, Mr. Chair, <laughs> <laughs> that's Mr. Wayne. We'll set it at one and a half. Back. Yeah, let's set the timer at one and a half from here on out. That's we really need to get moving. Thank you. Hold on one sec. Excuse me. Mr. No, since we already did took three minutes, yeah, we have to leave it at three minutes? Since we okay. already. We can leave it at whole minutes, Wayne. Please. Since we've already done it for three minutes for the other folks, yeah, um, council's advising right, go three going. minutes. Uh, you know, yep. we can leave it at three minutes, but we'll to the keep it at three minutes, and we'll continue to encourage the speakers to keep their comments <laughs> as brief as possible. I want to make sure that staff Please. has the ability to respond to comments. And we're ready. We're, we're rush. We have Steve Jepson followed by uh, Edward Philadelphia. 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 Hi, my name is Steve Jepson, Executive Director for the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works. I want to echo David Rothbart's comments about the Rule 1118 team. I work with uh, regulators all over the state and sometimes federally, and uh, they are great to work with, and we appreciate the co collaboration. You have or will be receiving a letter from SCAP's Big Sister, California Association of Sanitation Agencies, describing statewide concerns over this flare rule. The letter also includes a reference uh, to a PowerPoint presentation provided to South Coast staff on October 10 that uh, highlights research done by the national wastewater engineering firm Black & Veatch on flare performance challenges associated with the co-digestion of food waste. So now we are dangerously close to getting even further into the weeds there when David took us, but I will make it brief. The research includes three facilities, two of which are in Southern California and digest food waste. Addition of food waste or thermophilic digestion, higher temperature digestion, increases the concentration of ammonia gas in the digester. Increasing ammonia gas will inhibit ultra-low NOx flares from meeting the proposed NOx limit. That is making this proposed rule potentially impossible to comply with when food waste or thermophilic digestion is utilized. I'd like to direct your attention to slide 21 of the Black & Veatch presentation. Three flare manufacturers indicate they will not guarantee NOx emissions of their flares with the presence of ammonia gas. Big picture real quick, Senate Bill 1383, if you're not familiar with it, is a methane reduction plan, an air quality bill statewide being implemented by CalRecycle. This bill will divert organics from landfills, including food waste. We estimate that the sanitation agencies in California can accept uh, as much as 75% of this food waste and use the gas for beneficial purposes. If this rule is uh, implemented without exemptions for food waste or thermophilic digestion, it could be a barrier to SB 1383 implementation, which would be a shame. Finally, we respectfully request that the rule establish a 0.06 pound NOx per billion BTU limit and temporarily exempt any facility digesting food waste or utilizing thermophilic digestion. Thank you. David, the credibility is shot. Edward Philadelphia, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Uh, good morning. My name is Ed Edward Philadelphia. I'm with the uh, City of Riverside. I'm, I'm associated with the Region Riverside Regional Water Quality Control Plant, and um, I'm going and building off of that, um, we just completed a a uh, 200 million dollar modernization and expansion to our facility. We're one of the facilities that do have the ultra low NOx uh, flares. And uh, one of the things I just want to bring to your attention is is the food waste diversion. See, Riverside, you know, has taken has taken that we are going to manage our own food waste, and that is that uh, burden has fallen upon my shoulders to uh, be the source of it. Uh, just uh, you know, this is an ongoing study that we're moving forward with. We you know we've been experimenting with it, uh, but one thing that's came out, and this is most recently hot off the presses for us, is is that the city looks like it has almost 100 tons a day of food waste that can be diverted. Uh, when I start, if right now, even after all this work that we've done, I do have plenty of digester capacity to accept it, but I cannot take 100 tons per day. So what's going to be happening is, is that we'll be over time be adding more digestion to be able to, to take this. But what's, what's now become a concern is, the, is this recent study about ammonia that's uh, found in food waste. So my, right now, my ultra low NOx burner, my low NOx flare is in compliance and will burn gas, uh, you know, below 0.025, which is not a, which, which is fine. But now when I start adding more and more food waste into my blend, we're suspending this, and this ammonia case is true, I'm going to start seeing that rapidly start to increase and I'll have to stop because I won't be able to accept anymore because I'll, I'll hit my threshold and my permits. So with that in mind is, is that we need to really kind of take a look at either the 0.06 or some kind of exemption so we have a better understanding of blending this food waste into our, into our sludge. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Ann followed by Allison Ford. Hello again. My name is Terry Ann, representing Orange County Sanitation District. Um, as a longtime environment leader in our wastewater industry, um, OCSD uh, mission goes well beyond just treating wastewater by recovering all of valuable resources, and we see digestive gas as a valuable resource. Um, so in partnership with AKMD in um, 2010, we conducted the only successful technology assessment uh, feasibility study for 11.2 limits, and after that uh, successful uh, uh, project, we sp invested more than $33 million to retrofit all of our eight large digestive gas-fired engines with SCR and oxidation, uh, cat catalytic oxidation systems. So um, considering the large, large investment we put on these uh, digestive gas engines, the last thing we want to do is to flare. And as such, we typically flare less than 2% of the gas that we produce. So even though we rarely use these flares, they're an important part of our digestive gas management system that allows us to continuously provide essential public service. We also believe that food waste can be a valuable resource and have budgeted $6.3 million to design and construct an interim food waste receiving facility at one of our plants. The construction is set to start in December 2020 with the completion in, 20, in March 2022. Um, it's clear that the percentage of the food waste uh, dig digestion will increase as a result of SB 1383, but more time is needed to fully understand the potential impact of the fuel-borne fuel -borne nitrogen compounds on flare emissions. Therefore, we respectfully uh, request that the rule established not to limit at 0 0.06 pound per million BTU rather than 0 0.025 and exempt, at least for now, any facility <coughs> that digests food waste in thermophilic digesters from proposed rule 1118.1. Thank you. Okay, Allison Torres followed by Amber Baylor. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Allison Torres with Eastern Municipal Water District. District, excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this rule. Uh, EMWD agrees with the statements by other SCAP members uh, commenting on this rule. Uh, similar to other agencies, EMWD has ver various beneficial use projects at our wastewater treatment plants, and we attempt to use all the biogas um, produced by our process. However, flaring is still a uh, needed for the contingency purposes if the beneficial reuse options fail or require uh, downtime for maintenance. Uh, EMWD has one of the 0.025 ultra low NOx flares, back flares, and we've experienced repeated reliability issues with our installation. Um, this, these issues have resulted in many reported breakdowns to AQMD. 
Uh, and the uh, back determination that was recently adopted for these flares, um, we did comment uh, during this process as well as IEUA, who also has an ultra low NOx flare, um, regarding problems with these 0.025 pounds per million V2 flares, and uh, they were not strongly considered in the determination. EMWD agrees with the comments by other SCAP members, and we request the proposed rule establish the 0.02, 0.06 uh, pounds per million BTU uh, limit and temporarily accept facilities accepting food waste with thermophilic digestion. Thank you. Thank Minute you. and a half. Uh, Amber, that was good. Uh, and then followed by our last commenter was uh, Marissa Flores Acosta. Thank you. My name is Amber Baylor. I'm the Director of Environmental Compliance for the South Orange County Wastewater Authority, representing the minor source uh, perspective in this. SOCWA just installed engines with SCR pursuant to Rule 1110.2, which required NOx emission to be reduced to backed levels. The system is very difficult and time-consuming to operate and makes it harder to beneficially reuse, uh, oh, and, is, and makes it harder to beneficially reuse the digester gas. Essentially, all beneficial use options have become very complex and costly. Our agency alone um, has spent over $20 million in capital improvement projects. These systems periodically fail and require maintenance, so our flares must be reliable because we cannot vent raw digester gas to the surrounding community. Considering the lack of emission reductions associated with this rule, we'd rather see funding directed toward electric vehicles or some other projects that doesn't impact our, our ability to treat sewage and improve air quality. We request the rule establish a 0.06 pound of NOx of million um, BTU limit and exempt any facility digesting food waste and thermophilic digestion as we are planning to do in the future as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Marissa Flores Acosta. Good morning. My name is Marissa Flores Acosta. I'm with the City of San Bernardino Water Department, and we just uh, we, we echo the concerns raised by SCAP and its member agencies. Thank you. Do the best so far. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Can, can staff go ahead and address the, the concerns, especially the 0.06? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, a lot of the cons almost every comment you heard on, on all sides was related to the provisions in the rule that are talking about new flares. Uh, we worked very hard to come to consensus on the existing flares and those capacity thresholds and uh, so I think most of the issues are with the new flares, with whether a new flare would have to be at 0.6 or 0.025, and then even on the oil and gas, if you were going to permit a new flare at the very tight 0.018, is that enough of an incentive to go, go to a beneficial use? So I, I would suggest that in all the emission reductions we mentioned, the 0.2 tons per day, which is significant, uh, come from the existing flares. So the existing flare part of the rule, uh, I, would, I would hope that we can move forward with, but give us... I would request a week or two more on the new flares to work with stakeholders, and if we can't come to some uh, uh, understanding there, then maybe we can defer that to a future rule or maybe fold it into the rules we talked about uh, in the last item for uh, the landfills and the wastewater. And what about the suggestion of the uh, exemption for the, the digesters and the food waste digestion? Uh, I think we want to do a little more uh, work on that. Uh, it is possible that we can look uh, at that. The reason they can't necessarily meet the, the NOx limit is because the ammonia emissions would be higher than the current uh, limit uh, of 5 ppm on those ty that type of equipment. But we could look back and see whether we can adjust those a little bit for the greater good of getting the NOx reductions. Uh, but it's going to take a little bit more work on that. Uh, but for existing flares, the, the capacity threshold approach we mentioned will get us the emission reductions, uh, and if we could we could continue to work with the stakeholders on the new flares. What? Yeah. One thing I want to add on that. So we were, we did sit through that presentation that, that the, the industry provided, and one thing they were noting about this concern, which wasn't highlighted today, is that these what they what they believe is these NOx emissions are actually transforming into. I'm sorry, these uh, ammonia emissions will be transforming into no. nitrogen oxide or NOx emissions, and so actually that's an additive concern for us. So I would not recommend right. an exemption of anything 
if, there, this, if this becomes true. Mind you, this is all new information, even they're sort of sorting it out and we're all learning from this. But And this hasn't really come to play, right? We haven't really fully fleshed out this, this Senate bill in this food digestion, but it's happening, it will happen in the future. Anyway, the thing is that if this means increased NOx, we do not have to, re, we actually have to do the opposite. We have to take a look at this and figure out how more stringent we have to be. As a matter of fact, that 70% threshold that the wastewater industry currently is provided in this current rule proposal would likely have to be reduced because that would mean we need to be added and more concerned about those uh, additional NOx emissions that we are not currently considering today. Uh, there's another issue, too, that I just want to note. We, we, just to remind everybody, under the existing that Phil was talking about, they can continue using their existing flares. The CRR and R example, for example, that was provided, that particular facility is already at a 0 0.06, and they will be able to continue <clears throat> utilizing it. So even though they need to do some flaring, Hold on right there. Their official use, Mind, they can continue. Excuse me for a second. My understanding is the CRNR facility has built one of four units, and as they add the other three units, they will have to put in flares to, in, in addition to the flares they have right now for those other units. And that's a critical function of it for our area, and not, I say my area, Riverside, but also for LA, because LA is now sending their food waste out there as well. So I, I would be, we need to look into that. If, if that's not true, that they don't need any other flares, or the flare they have will work and that's all they need, great. But my understanding is, no, they will have to have more flares, and that's a serious concern for, I think, for all of us in this room. We, all of us elected officials that have to deal with our, the impact of this new state law of taking all these food waste. So. Point taken. Just another reminder about the first two five is, is that, that, remember, that is already existing back. So if these were major sources coming in, they're already held to that point zero two five. We're not creating anything new here with regards to the major sources. It would, would be affecting the minor sources. And we don't have flexibility when it comes to that if it's already not established. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I Go just ahead. like to say that there are a lot of problems here with this rule <laughs> that we need to work out. And um, as I understand it, the flares are used primarily only for emergency. Am I right on that? Not for these that works. types of, not for these types of not for facilities. These types. Yeah, for wastewater these are facilities. Right, so for the wastewater, and it's just that's they're getting a, they're having a constant gas production for both the wastewater. So they, they don't want that, to flare because right, but waste. they're using the gas to the extent they can. A lot of them are. That's true. Like, right. Power yeah, they are, sure, yeah. But it's right. more operational, and it's just a question of the varying gas. How much operational need do they have? Right. So it's not really emergency. They don't want to flare. Yeah. But, but in some cases they have to. Equipment goes down and we just don't want the, the choice to be when they're ch choosing between a beneficial use project and a flaring project, we don't want the choice to be, oh, we can just flare it 24 seven. There's NOx emissions associated with that and we think there's plenty of technologies to help get them to beneficial use. So that's where the capacity thresholds come in. They can only go up to 70% of the capacity at say a wastewater treatment plant. plant. The rest would have to go into some kind of beneficial use. But if they have trouble meeting that in one year, they still have another year. <coughs> exceed at that point, they still have more time to plan to figure out that beneficial use project. But again, the existing flares, we have a uh, pretty good agreement, and people could stand up if I'm wrong on that. Uh, it's really the new flares that came up in the discussion, and I think we have some work to do there. And then- uh, Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the other thing that we're seeing is AB 1383, you know, which is going to require food waste to be, you know, disposed of in, in, our, yeah. in these digesters. So, we've got kind of competing uh, policies going on here that I think we need to take a look at. Uh, you raised the point that, well, if it's going to be more ammonia, it's going to be higher NOx, so we do have to address it. But, uh, and I agree that we will have to do that. But I do think, you know, we, we need to work on this. I think uh, staff needs to, like, be working on uh, with the, uh, with our, our, our people, our wastewater treatment plants and the landfill plant, and um, see where we can find some common ground that uh, makes some sense. It doesn't cost them so much that they, well, who's going to pay that cost? This is public. This is going to be public, public uh, expense. So, sure. I think uh, that we need to do a little more work on this. Okay. Would, was there any motion here, or we just? Well, there's no motion, but staff is asking. 
to take this to, to public hearing in December. I don't feel like we're ready. Staff, do you really think we're ready to, to have some time to get this done or we're, we do this in January, give us a little bit more time? Well, again, I would, I would suggest uh, to the committee that for we set hearing uh, in November through December, I think we're okay on existing flares. And if we can't come, we're still working on some pull ideas out of the rule. for the new flares. We could pull that out and defer that discussion. We're still under RAC requirements. So the, what we have on the existing flares will help us. Well, just like you want to motivate them to use beneficial use of their gas, we want to motivate you to resolve these issues. So <laughs> we'll figure out what we said hearing in, in November, but you've got a couple of weeks before then. Please try to try to do that. Uh, there's a beneficial yeah. use that I didn't see listed, and I think it should be considered. I'm not sure how much volume they use. But there's an amazing company in Newport Beach, Costa Mesa area that, that takes uh, methane from landfills and turns it into renewable plastics. They they have they have tickled a bug. They got little bugs that you know they got bugs that make methane. They have bugs that make methane into plastic. It's just amazing. They they figured out the bug to make methane into plastic. Um, they've got a lot of contracts with a lot of, you know, uh, big companies. Um, I think there might, I don't know if they have competitors out there or not. They didn't last time I checked, but it's an amazing company called New Light Technologies. Look into them. I think it's a beneficial use that might actually uh, relieve some of the problems with, with what to do with gas, especially when there's not a pipeline available. They can pull in and, and set up their bugs and start digesting right there on, on the spot. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a beneficial use, I think, that I didn't see in the staff report, and I think staff should, should consider. Uh, obviously, need to do some more research into what capacity they have and what use they need and, and, and all that, but uh, it's, it's beyond okay. the, the list you have. Okay. Good recommendation. We need to wrap this up. Any other board member comments? Uh, Susan, can we take the reclaim quarterly report next month? Yes. yes. Very good. With that, we have the written reports that are attached. Do our board members have any other business that we'd like to bring forward? There any public comments? We have uh, one public comment card. Sure. Okay. Uh, public comment Aaron, on that. I promise I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Erin Bonnet. I'm with World Energy. Uh, World Energy recently purchased the Alt Air Bio Refining Facility in Paramount. We're looking forward to welcoming um, several of you and your staff um, uh, to our facility next Wednesday. Um, at this facility, we produce 100% renewable fuels for use in diesel, jet, and gasoline engines. Uh, we are proud to be producing only renewable energy um, and are supportive of AQMD's air quality goals. Um, our production process has dramatically reduced NOx and completely removed the carcinogens, xylene, and benzene from our process. Um, still, we are manufacturing an energy product, and we do have schools and homes nearby. We are committed to being good neighbors, and we're looking at additional investments so that we can further reduce our remaining outputs. Uh, we look forward to working um, with you to find ways to make our facility not only compliant, but help the region um, towards its air quality goals. You said it was renewable jet fuel, right? Yes. You invited me to that. I don't think I can make it, but thank okay. you for the invitation. No, and thank really you for considering what you're doing. Yes. Thank thank you. Very good. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting. Thank you all for attending. Have a good day.